Hi, hello, good afternoon to all, and uh, welcome uh, to the Medical Humanities webinar series, The Power of Positive Thinking Insights into a Patient and Caregiver's Journey. Uh, my name is Warren. I'm a rheumatologist uh, based in Singapore General Hospital. And together with me uh, moderating this event is Dr. Rosan. He's a geriatrician in uh, Sengkang Hospital. Uh, and today uh, we have two speakers uh, with us uh, and we are very honoured uh, for them to be here to share with us their positive experiences and mindset uh, that have helped them overcome not only their challenges uh, but have converted them into opportunities for success. Uh, and so uh, to start the ball rolling, uh, I have with me uh, Mr. Stephen Chan. So he actually uh, received the Inspirational uh, Caregiver Award uh, back in 2021. And this award is given to uh, caregivers uh, who expire uh, confidence and also inspire their patients uh, in their care. Uh, and we have uh, Miss Violet Un as well. And she received uh, the Partner in Care Award as an inspirational patient in 2021. And this is awarded uh, to patients uh, who are engaged in their own care and actively partner the healthcare team in their care journey experience. Um, so she's well known to us, uh, both as a chef and, and she owns many restaurants and is a food ambassador for Singapore since 1988, as I understand. And uh, she's going to share with us uh, what's happened to her in uh, 2014. Uh, and uh, without stealing more of the thunder, uh, may I invite uh, Violet, maybe you could start uh, by sharing with us your experiences in 2014 and what happened. Violet, please. Okay, good morning, everybody. Nice to be here. What happened was um, in June, I remember, and at night, it was about 10 something, and I sort of lost balance totally on my left hand side and um so difficult to explain and my future daughter-in-law came and she said she's a doctor and said i think you have cerebellar so i went to gh and i was there uh for five weeks and i couldn't actually uh walk or you know move properly but i was um i think i'm very lucky because i'm fascinated by experiences so the first thing was they sent me a speech therapist and you know then about swallowing i was wondering why and um i think the most important part was that i was never depressed and i think uh that's uh, uh that's, that's a blessing i wasn't never depressed and i think part of it is a mindset you know you're sharing i sort of uh, the most important i did my hair and makeup every day and I think I want to share this because when you're a patient in hospital, bad enough, you feel bad. Then secondly, you look bad, you feel even worse in the hospital. So I, I, I sort of uh, WhatsApp to my daughter, bring my uh, hair dryer, so everything. I, I sort of, I, I had to be helped to the shower. I had to be uh, in a wheelchair. And I was, I think, a very obedient patient because I believe in my medical, you know, everybody around knows what they're doing. And I don't know what's happening to me. And so uh, I sort of made sure every morning I had, you know, my face done, my hair done. I did it myself because and you see my pictures and you look good, right? So, um, and like, I felt that I had go back to normal. So I, I'm very, I was very blessed because I could um, talk and I could move and everything. And so I had the chefs coming for meetings in the hospital, in the uh coffee house in you know like and and you know whatever you can do just do like you know saying so I, I went down and I and the picture that you see on the top was a meeting with an American who was in town and I was never I was never I never looked worse than that like, you know what I'm saying like, the worst is kind of <laughs> yeah and, and you know I had I, I think uh I, I think what I want to share is that you have to believe that the medical practitioners know what they're doing and you cannot be doctor by Google, which a lot of people do, honestly. You know, so I, I, I went one day to my uh, GP and said, you know, I've got this uh, statin and I read it's not so good. So my GP said, please just listen to the doctor. <laughs> you know, whatever they give you, they know what they're giving. I said, okay. Because a lot of people are doctors by Google. I think you face that. And, you know, um, you're not even sure whether you can't interpret the Google information, right? You know, and... And I was, um, 
I ate everything that they gave me. I'm the most obedient patient. I never smuggled anything. <laughs> and, um, you know, I had to puree the food, the puree the meat and just eat it. And the patient next to me had half her skull gone and she's taste complaining the food is not tasty. I said, less salt, less sugar, less oil, of course, different taste, right? Just get used to it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I think that that's a big issue with Singaporeans. And I, I am, uh, I sort of grew up, I, you know, I eat the best food in the world, right? But mm. I grew up being brought up by parents who I was put in a convent to get used to life for World War III, lah, you know? <laughs> and once you're used to some uh, deprivation, which is very good, and I, I think that's what, that's, that's a learning. I think people just have to be used to deprivation, right? And, and, and you know, surround yourself with loved ones and, you know, and think happy. Now, there's a picture of me with my occupational therapist giving a baking class. And that was wonderful. I went for the baking class and she, she had it all done. And it made a real difference because there were some patients who were much more um, non-ambulant. I mean, you know, not, not, they, they had a worse condition than me. And this baking class and, you know, and, and there was a, a, a Malay man and he, he made this cookies. I said, isn't it wonderful you can have for Hari Raya, for your family? And, and he was so motivated. And, and I sort of, I admire, you know, that for this occupation therapist to do this class. Now. So somebody asked me, did you give the baking? I said, no, I did not give the baking class. I went to the baking class, you know, because in that class, we had to relearn, like even, you know, to reach out and all that. And, and so it's reaching and things like that. So that was me as a patient. I think I was a very good patient. Um, I think I'm still a very good patient, you know, and, and I, 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 I think that's a sharing and maybe a bit more sharing. Um, I think as patients, we should be very mindful of the care that we get in the hospital. And uh, the, the, the patient next to me said every morning, nurse, I told you, uh, this break, you have to microwave five seconds. I'm saying, my goodness, this nurse isn't your, you know, isn't the waitress, you know what I'm saying? And then somebody else was complaining, a friend of mine uh, on Facebook, that uh, the nurse did not know how to heat up a croissant. Now, if you heat up a croissant, it cannot be in a microwave, it must be in an oven, oven. So otherwise it gets, but you know, the nurse is not a chef, right? <laughs> At the same time, yes. information I know, you also will know as a doctor, right? So yeah. I, I think we have to, I, I don't know how to, uh, Educate people how to be patients. Okay. I, I think is I think I, I think it's very important, you know. And yeah. uh, I think if you uh, the the menu choices that you get are amazing. You can have from Chinese, Malay, Indian, you know. And the whole afternoon they're taking your menu for the next day. <laughs> now I think if you're in a hospital in America, there's no choice, right? Nobody worries about food, you know. Nobody worries about how tasty it is, and. And, and these are things which I think, um, I don't know how to communicate to patients, how to be a patient, you know. I, I, feel, I, I personally feel that, being a patient. And, mm. um, and I'm so grateful for the care I got and I'm still getting. And um, so, okay, now what did I do after that? So, you know, for me, um, I was, and, and uh, maybe the next, next slide, and, and, you know, life will never be the same. You know, I get blur, blur. I get, um, I get um, you know, and, and I, have, I have balance issues. So I notice that when I look down and that pathway is like a pathway with stones and everything, my mind goes into Kalangkabo. It goes into a scramble because I'm looking at something which I think my mind cannot handle, right? Then immediately I feel less balanced, but I know it. So at that point, I have I always hold on to somebody's arms. All these poor men all over the place, can I have your hand, you know? And they will just give me the hand. But the point is that I carry a walking stick. So when you carry a walking stick, they know that you're not being funny, right? <laughs> See? So it's important that the walking stick, I don't use it uh, because I don't need it, but I carry it in case I slip. Because mm. my neurologist said I shouldn't use a walking stick because it's a third leg, which is not normal. So I'm listening to them. But that is a message to every member of the public that you are not, that you are, 
you know, you, you, are, you have medical issues, now, right? You're carrying a walking stick. So anytime I go out, I think the next thing is, do not be afraid to ask for help. I do it all the time, hotel doorman, any strange man, can I have your hand? Or can I have your arm? And when they see the walking stick, it's okay. They, they, they feel that, you know, definitely they will help me. And, um, and, and I think you, you have to learn to be knowing that your limitations and not be embarrassed uh, because people are. And I, I feel myself that uh, being a well-known person uh, and I don't mind showing these disabilities because I think that's my, if I'm a well-known person and I'm not shy, so mm. it will maybe give message to other people that they don't have to be shy. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And I'm not yes, shy sir. about it, you know? And I think uh, now, okay, having a stroke, having all this is not good, but to me, it's, there's a good side to it. A good side to it is I now, I said, oh, I can understand what people go through when they have when they have challenges and knowing what people go through what can i do to help people that don't go through it understand what it is for example an autistic child you know uh, i explain to them you know, when, when i see that i say okay let me just help this person and then the mother says i met a stranger the, the, my son is autistic then i explain to her, i said you know what happens when he goes in the meltdown this is what happens to his brain because it happens to me but I can interpret it, you know, I said, suddenly, if I cannot take it, my mind is a total scramble. And then sometimes I can see stars. And if I'm not careful, I can faint, which I've never done. You know, I just have to stop. Because if you keep on your seeing stars, and at that point, you cannot take it. You really cannot take it. And uh, I explained it to her. And I said, as a child, then he doesn't know what's happening. Then he gets hysterical. Mm -hmm. But I will say, I need to sit down. And I, I was so happy when she told me, okay, finally somebody has explained to me what happens to him. And, and I think uh, for me, I put new life, a different life. It will never be the same. I cannot uh, walk up even one step without somebody helping me. Because I need, you know, I know that in my mind, I can fall. So I think your mind is so powerful. If you're, in your mind, you can fall, you can fall. You know what I'm saying? And, and it, yes. It's, yeah, and I don't know whether, you know, your doctors, mm. right? Uh, if, if in my mind at a split second, I can't stand up, I can't. So it's the power of the mind, which I think is amazing, mm. right? Yeah. So, uh, and, and I think um, maybe, have I finished by 10 minutes? Yes, we have. No worries. <laughs> <Don't tell me. laughs> and I think that um, it's, it's a new life. You know, I, I never think of yesterday uh, and what was. Uh, Every, and we shouldn't be like that because to other people in Ukraine and all, what was yesterday was so different from today. And that today is worse than anything we can ever imagine, right? You know, mm -hmm. you suddenly yes. go to starvation, you suddenly go to war. So it helps to think of people worse than you. I mean, as a patient, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, life changes for people overnight. So it doesn't, you don't have to get sick to be having, having your life change overnight. So, mm -hmm. I uh, and I I do whatever I can do, but I know I I know I cannot push myself. So when I do filming, I mean I know I get tired after a certain point. So even when I'm cooking, if I'm doing, I do a lot of filming. I, I did a lovely series of programs for Straight Times uh, last year called Life in Food by Violet Moon. And I tell them I get tired, so it's catered to. You know, I, I, have, I have my assistant who prepares every single thing. I, I cannot cook from beginning to end the way I used to, you know. But then I can use cooking as a tool. Mm. And how does it help? I'm so happy that um, mentally I'm very alert. And, you know, the, I can be in bed and using the phone as my computer. So I'm working nonstop. <laughs> like last night I produced this video, this, this, um, this um, uh, sort of bit, uh, uh, yes. slides now yes. and I'm a very bad person I don't exercise but to me everything is exercise so something drops I say don't pick it up for me let me pick it up I want to bend let me do mm. it don't help me you know it may take a long time but let me do it so to me that's my exercise you know that, that's my therapy and uh, let, let me do this let me do that and I think um, 
I, I, after my stroke in 2014, uh, life is never the same, right? But, um, but life is so wonderful. I mean, I got a lifetime achievement for outstanding contribution to tourism in 2019. And, you know, the tourism board came and made a beautiful video, which I have, it's called my tribute video. And then I, I created a series of, okay, when I got my tribute, uh, when I got my tourism award, the same week I turned 70. And so I think, what must I do to show that I deserve this? You know, you know, when you get an award, it's for your past work, right? But to me, you have to do future work. That shows you're an awardee, right? <laughs> you are deserving of it. And uh, what do you do in the future? So I thought that I had never done social work. I mean, community work enough my whole life. You know, I, I really don't do things that I should have done. So I decided to do seven things to, to celebrate each decade of my life. And, you know, and, and that was very meaningful for me. And I have, um, I have always done sort of, uh, I, I have a vision about people who are challenged. I call them challenged, right? You know, you know mentally challenged, mm -hmm. uh, physically challenged. And I've done it before. Like I, I did like, you know, how I said to a parent, when you have a child that's challenged, the most frightening thing is what are they going to do when they grow up, when I'm gone, right? And so... I, I think that sometimes when we showcase, uh, let's say a charity event or something, I don't think it's correct to show them doing things which are painting or something, they're not going to make a living. So I will do things and I get them to be involved that something the parents think, oh, maybe there's hope. Maybe Thanks very much, Violet. Yeah, yeah I think you have highlighted uh, you know, many points. Uh, no, not only are you uh, positive to begin with and, and you know you have overcome your, your challenges uh, very aptly, uh, but you have also highlighted you know the actually the, the need uh, and the importance of, of people around you uh, helping you. you know and, and I think that's it's a very nice segue into what Stephen has, has done. Uh, Mr. Stephen, uh, if you could, if I could trouble you, uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit more of, uh, you know, how, how did you actually, you know, uh, uh, well, why did you actually receive the award and uh, what was the experience like? Uh, thank you, Dr. Fong. Um, well, I, 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 I don't kind of um, call myself really an inspirational caregiver. Uh, but just allow me to share my slides so I go through and lead you through to my journey. Uh, as a caregiver, and as you could see over here, uh, I'm just another caregiver rather than an inspirational caregiver to myself because when I look at my sis, my elder sis, she's my inspiration. If she's my inspiration, then I can't be an inspirational caregiver in that sense. Um, you know, my, my elder sis, the way she looked after my parents is just very marvelous. I, I shall not go into that because that makes me very emotional. <laughs> yeah, um, so as a caregiver, um, you know, I'm just going to show, show with you, you know, my, my journey, uh, how I actually begin um, as a caregiver to my in-law, even before uh, I got married, actually. Okay, I mean, I, I, I just don't want to kind of um, just go into a proper, well, my journey begins as a caregiver in the late 1980s when I was a medic in the army. Uh, the benefit of being a medic in the army is that you get close to medical officers. And I happens to know the uh, um, our medical officer who is our current minister for manpower, Dr. Tan Siling. And I actually shared with him the problem of the varicose vein of my father-in-law. And she, he actually introduced a doctor in Tan Tok Seng. Uh, and that's how I started this varicose vein uh, with my father-in-law since uh, before I even marry my wife <laughs> so that was in the 80s and I thought after the um, uh, surgery and things that things goes on very well and uh, my wife and I we are actually planning to move on and uh, migrate not really migrate but move on to Australia to to really start a, a new life as the academicians there and things like that um, but before we could actually move on the first heart attack happened to my father-in-law and at that point in time I recall we were just outside the A&E department. The doctors came out and told us that, uh, okay, my father-in-law has a heart attack. 
he need to do a standing. At that point in time, the question was, so we go ahead. Everybody stare at me. And it looks like I have to be the one making the decision. And mind you, I'm just a son-in-law, you know. If a decision is not a good decision, I'll be hated for life. By that point in time, I realized that, hey, I need to be the one making the decision. I should say, yes, please go ahead. We will have that standing. And there it goes and things goes on. And then you could see that more medical conditions comes about, heart attack, heat replacement, COPD, varicose ulcer, diabetes, whole list of medical conditions comes about. But the, 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 the main issue I always have is still always the varicose ulcer because that really compromises his uh, um, you know, quality of life because he just couldn't walk well and things like that. And having to wash you know, his leg and clean up his leg regularly um, is really a chore. Uh, so initially, my, my mother-in-law has to bring him to the polyclinic very, very often. Uh, but I thought that that kind of, you know, quite a heavy burden on her. And so I decided that says, okay, since I'm medically trained in that sense, a medic, I took on the um, responsibility to clean up his wound. Uh, on days whereby, you know, an, an evening where I go back to the place for dinner, I just wash out the wound and things like that. So, but then the ulcers never get better or rather it gets better and they get worse again, get better and get worse again. And, I, you know, things just couldn't move on. Um, but, you know, thank God, you know, I, 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 I happen to be working with a lot of medical doctors and medical doctors always look at journal, medical journal. So I started reading medical journals as well. And I, some, I found out some studies that shows that silver dressing is able to provide some antimicrobial effect. Um, and I started to read out some, um, you know, some of those dressings and I find this became um, silver foam dressing and I started to use it and it shows a lot of improvement. And of course, I'm happy with that. That means that I don't have to go that often to clean out the wound. Yes, yeah, so things seem to be taking, a, 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 you know, it, it looks good until a fall in late 2018. Sorry that I couldn't find a fall, but, it, you know, this is a fall, but it's not really the fall that I'm talking about the fall, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it changed their whole narrative all over again, and he had a very bad fall. Um, and my wife and I were saying that, hey, it's time, it's time to um, move him in to our place. But that requires a lot of buying. Um, you know, we started to talk about it, uh, a lot of rejection, because, you know, that would mean that uh, bringing them from a familiar place to an unfamiliar place. But it took us quite a while. Even before we decided on uh, moving him, them into our place, I actually have to speak to my parents as well. Because I wanted my parents to give me that blessing. So we took a year. Um, of course, things happen at home as well. And finally, they decided to say, okay, we shall move in. But how? How is he going to move into your house? When at I mean I'm staying in a HDB masonry, that means there are two levels. All the all the uh, all the uh, uh, bedroom is actually upstairs. So what should I do? My father-in-law just couldn't go upstairs. I got to do a minor DIY renovation. I actually transformed the entire living room into a bedroom, and dining room become my living room, and then a, a little small area in front of the door it becomes my dining room. Everything changed, and uh, the, the having the luxury of a living room to me is actually very important because. That's when myself and my wife uh, chill out when we want to remove ourselves from uh, work, you see. But then we know that that is the inconvenience that we need to uh, have. Lah. So after moving in, we thought life will be better. They look after us. We look after them. Things will be good. But lo and behold, more hospitalization comes along. Look at this. He moved in in uh, July 2019. Within two months, his first hospitalization. June 2020, the next hospitalization. August 2020, another hospitalization. October 2020, yet another hospitalization. And mind you, that was during the part time where we were actually having our COVID. That was pretty challenging. And I'm being slapped with this entire whole list of medication. Who would take these medications? I do not know. And I got to take out, continue the responsibility of putting the medicines into trays to make sure that the medicines are taken correctly and well and not being mixed out. 
I have this particular tray that has four, seven days and each day I have four different compartments. I make sure that, you know, each compartment is having the correct medicine for the correct timing because there are medicine that needs to be taken out upon waking up. There's medicine that needs to be taken 30 minutes before food and things like that. So all this got to be packed well and long list. Not only that, I'm actually try, I've actually transformed our home into a nursing home. I actually created a chart like this for monitoring of his condition. We actually get a geriatric chair. We actually have a commode at home as well. We have our BP measurement. We have our glucose uh, 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 kit as well. And not forgetting our SPO2 uh, kit as well. And we have to do all this uh, uh, regularly and, and my house really becoming like a home. But my approach back then was, you know, getting everybody helps because I know I can't do it by myself. I define everybody's role. I became like the commander in chief, tell everybody, this is your role. So I'll have the domestic helper to do out all the reading every day, teach her how to do the reading using the, the, the readers and things like that. My, my wife will be in charge of the, the buying of food because I tell him, okay, if this particular reading is no good, this thing got to cut, you don't buy any more such food and things like that. So everybody comes in and I tell everybody, please don't ever say that you do not know what to do. Everybody knows what to do. Just ask, what can I do? As long as you are willing to do something, you know, there will be bound to be something that we can do. But most importantly, is the last statement that over here you see is not what we want, it's what he wants. This is a statement a professor actually gave it to me when we were looking after my father who passed on in 19, 1920. Yes. Stephen, are you okay? Yes, yes, yes. can take a moment let me just tell you while well, well, you take a moment that you are absolutely yeah, yeah. inspirational you know what all you do for your for your father-in-law and yeah. what all you've done is amazing so sorry about that yeah, yeah so um he was telling me and always remind me that you know when we are looking after people who are in the end of life we don't impose on them what we want but we need to know what they really want and give it to them but of course not compromising their their medical conditions. So that was the thing that I was trying to balance things out, but it's never easy. So the challenges I have, you know, during that period of time is that I got to adapt to a, a new life, living with new family. Cleaning of wounds is not easy to many, I mean, to, to some people, it is, looks so simple, but it's not easy because we got to schedule our time around it to make sure that we remember the cleaning and things like that. But I think the most difficult part that I faced was people accusing me of being disrespectful. When I tell them that, hey, my father-in-law is having dementia. We can't treat him like a normal person anymore. We can't treat him like an adult. He need to be taught all over again like kids. And there I was being slapped with, why are you so disrespectful to your father-in-law? How could you say such a thing? So that was quite a challenge to me because to me, filial priority is number one. Yeah, so, well, so I took a different approach. Instead of continue to convince them by words, I convinced them by action, by showing them how to make him learn. And at the beginning, he, he do not even know how to bathe himself. But eventually when our domestic helper when his, her contract ended she needs to go back to her hometown and that was during COVID time we don't intend to bring anybody in with the you know being mindful that you know they could be bringing the COVID into the house so we decided that we will handle things on our own and so I started to teach him how to bathe and when the whole family saw the way I kind of trained him how to bathe they then then and then they realized what I meant by teaching him like a kid again. Need to show him everything over and over again and reminding him over and over, over again and things that he needs to do. So I, I, I thought I was pretty happy when, when things move on. 
But of course, the feeling of entitlement of a patient is always there. The patient always think yeah, I'm sick, I'm always entitled to this and I'm entitled to that. That is something that, you know, as a caregiver, we really need to um, really need to kind of accept the fact that, uh, well, we just have to give it to them anyway. Uh, but of course, um, you know, we, we do not compromise their, uh, their care and concern again. Yeah, I shall move on. Uh, so the response, the lesson I learned really is that, you know, don't ever take all the responsibility upon, your, upon yourself. Share the responsibility among everybody. There's going to be bound to be a lot, a lot of frustration uh, among the different caregivers. Allow them to air it, but don't ever judge it. Because everybody has different perception about things. Let them air it and let them cool off after that. And allow everyone to have me time. That one is something that we actually found out as well when our caregiver uh, went back. Um, you know, 24 hours become like, you know, for every 24 hours, my mother-in-law is looking after my father-in-law in that sense. Um, and, and, you know, the strain gets tighter and tighter and, 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 and more and more quarrels comes about. So we decided that, you know, we, we decided that we should bring him out and put him into a daycare, care, a daycare home as well. So that really helps a bit in their relationship in a sense. And the last thing, like I mentioned, communicate right. Some people just don't like the way, you know, you tell them that, you know, you need to treat them like a kid. Then you treat it, you know, you communicate in other way to make sure that they actually learn their things as well. I'm not going to take up too much time. I'm going to have two feedback. One is the very good feedback that I have, you know, during this whole entire period of time, I must say is that, you know, um, I'm impressed with how, uh, you know, uh, Sing Health implemented this regular update via phone during the COVID time. I think that was very marvelous. Every evening, I'll just wait patiently for the uh, MO to call me to update me on the um, condition. They are all very patient, uh, even though I sometimes can be very naggy, uh, you know, but they are very patient to explain to me all the different things. I even have the opportunity to discuss over the phone with the uh, geriatricians as well as the vascular surgeons because initially we are supposed to send him for another operation on the vas vascular ulcer. But after discussion with the vascular surgeons, the consensus is that, you know, at his age, we should just hold it and then do a conservative treatment. And I must, I must say this, that, you know, the vascular nurses are very, very encouraging. They are my inspiration, seriously. They are the force that pushed me through. Each time I visit them, they always have encouraging words. But with the good, I will also have something sad to say. This is something that my wife came back with and she was very upset for two couple of days actually after that we were, we were in the clinic. I wouldn't say what clinic it is. Uh, we, I mean, my father-in-law was being referred to the clinic and when we brought there, the, the, the doctor was telling us, I don't understand why you bring him here. There's nothing I can do. And you should consider yourself fortunate that he's still alive. Well, we know, we know that he is, you know, it is end stage, but I think there's better way of communicating bad news to, 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 to the caregiver. And, and I hope, you know, that um, doctors, we understand, I truly understand what you are going through. Um, but do bear in mind that, you know, as caregiver, such words hurts a lot. Give us a lot of sleepless nights. And with this, I want to thank you. And I just hope that, you know, these are the two phrases that I hope that I could, uh, you know, I could have the audience to bring home to know that, you know, at the end life, it is not what we want, but it is what he wants. And to anybody who is supporting the caregiving portion, don't say I don't know what to do, but just ask what I can do. I think this will help the caregiver a lot, a lot in their caregiving. And I thank you. And I'm sorry for being too emotional as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you, thank you. I'm really sorry for your loss, um, but absolutely inspirational. Um, before, before we get to the q and I think let me just tell everyone, thank you for joining us. And if you all have any comments, any questions, feel free to put in the chat box. Um, if you're shy, you can just address to the panelists and, and, or a specific person, but if it's okay, you can even share with everyone also. So we all can see the comments and the questions. I think so far there are two. I think one person agrees with uh, with Violet that we should educate people how to be a patient, and that will improve um, 
the way patient and doctors interact and they'll have a better, I mean, more moderate expectations when they come to hospital. Second one is uh, awarding Stephen the son, son in law of the year award. So, um, so I, I think it's, I definitely agree with that. Um, so, so Stephen, I think I told you before how inspiring I thought how you so resourceful to go and read up journals and look for silver dressing and all that. Um, and you, you, you do do a lot of things and you mentioned that wound care is not easy. I absolutely agree with that. Actually, you know, you are doing the work of many nurses and doctors in one person. You know, you are like not even, not even three in one form, when you're like six or seven in one. Because wound care, usually we get wound nurse, wound doctors, you know, diabetes, we get diabetes nurse, we get diabetes doctors. Geriatricians, we get geriatric nurse, we get geriatric doctors, you know, for the dementia. You are doing all of that in one shot, you know. I'm sure you are, you express, you do express burnout sometimes, right? How do you cope with that? You and your wife, especially, you know, and, and everyone at home, you know, what do you do in your free time to just recharge? Uh, well, so I, I, unfortunately, during the period of time where we are really into caregiving, that was during the COVID. Uh, we can't really go out of the house that much. But the fortunate thing, of course, is that, uh, you know, um, we have two levels in our house. Uh, so the level, the second level become our haven in that sense. So that becomes a place where we were chill out and we were cool off. Uh, of course, my wife has always been, you know, my, my uh, what do you call that? My, my dartboard, whenever I have some <laughs> frustration, that's where, do, 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 and she'll just get hit it. But of course, sometimes she will also feel that and then she will just uh, throw it back at us. Um, but I must say that strangely, during this difficult time, it looks like our relationship improved even more. Uh, because of the fact that we know that we have each other to rely on to go through this period of time. So essentially, I think um, caregiver, don't do it yourself if you can. Uh, do it with somebody whom you think you can share the burden with and work with. But have the understanding that, you know, uh, we are going to step on each other. But do, like I mentioned, don't judge, just listen. And I always remember, you know, back then during the time when my sis was looking after my mom, my, my father and my mother, um, my sis and our, or rather all our siblings, we actually have one common understanding. That is whatever that our parents said to just one kids, don't ever take it as the truth. Verify with the rest. So that is something that we also think that, you know, as a caregiver, don't just listen to what, you know, the patient tell you please verify because that might not be the truth. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, it importantly is to have a place, someone that you can talk to, uh, someone that you trust that whatever darts you throw at him or her, he or she will not throw back at you. Uh, and, and that will probably uh, move on. And um, But again, you still need a lot of me time. And with the COVID easing, um, actually my office become my haven as well because there's a place where I kind of escaped from home and kind of uh, get myself away from the issues at home and focus on other things as well. Yeah, I, I hope I have, I've answered your question. Yes, definitely. I have one more before before we go back to Dr. Warren. Your, your, your father-in-law has not been diagnosed with dementia, is that correct? And he's following up with the geriatricians? Uh, according to the geriatricians, it has been shown to be a dementia because the scan, the, the scan has shows that it has shrunk actually. Okay. So what do you do at home to engage him? You know, like you, as you said, the, dis, the disrespectful part, I think those guys are wrong. I think you're absolutely right. Sometimes you must treat them not the same way as they were before. So what do you do at home to engage him, you know, to, to stimulate his mind, to, to just get him more active besides the daycare? Uh, unfortunately, he's a very quiet man. He's a man of no words. Only Unless you talk okay. to him, he doesn't talk. So actually, at the beginning, uh, what I did was I tried to get my um, uh, sister-in-law to pass me some of the kids' flashcard to kind of help him to do things. Uh, I even get some of the toy whereby, you know, placing of shapes onto yeah. the different plates. Um, I even get them to send me pictures of the kids so that I can print out and show him and ask him who they are and things like that. I try to engage him by asking him who is this and who is that and things like that. But unfortunately, after a few sentences of conversation, he'll start keeping quiet and just do this. So it's a little bit discouraging sometimes, but 
Yeah. But once in a while, we just come back to him and uh, I, I like to do this uh, sometimes, you know, once I reach home, I will just appear in front of him. Well, who am I? You know, yeah. just to make him remember me. That's all. Yeah. Um, yeah. And ask him who is his, what is his name and things like that. Um, it is always very challenging talking to him. Geriatrician in the uh, DMC will know when we push him to visit any doctors, he will just keep quiet there. Ask him what is today's date. He will just stand back. I don't know. <laughs> and that's always his answer. So yeah. engaging him is always very challenging. Um, I have some conversation with people in the homes as well. Uh, they are telling him that, you know, they are trying to engage him as well. So as what I've experienced as well, he will initially go with it. After a while, he just give up and just sit there. So it's pretty challenging. But uh, if you have suggestion, please let me know how could I improve on this. <laughs> I will, we will take it offline for sure. By the way, for your information, I was also trained in SGH before I come to Sengkang. And DMC level four was my was my battleground to be to say that. <laughs> so, so all the guys you see in DMC level four, I know them. And I'll pass your compliments to them. You said the discussion you had with the generation was very good. So I'll pass the message on to the department yes, for yes. sure. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you thank you, Dr. Warren. Thanks, thanks, Stephen, for your very inspirational story. And, and going al along that line, I, I'm just wondering, Violet, you know, you are sort of by nature, you know, a, a very positive uh, person. Uh, has that always been the case with you? And, you know, if not, uh, could you maybe share with us your, your secret of how to inculcate that, you know, uh, or to inculcate that in, in others who, who do not have this positive mindset from the beginning? Um, I think I've always been like that. I mean, I'm, I'm very fortunate in the way I was brought up. I've, I've lived in many countries, um, but... I think the, the great fortunate is that my parents always brought me up to say, you better prepare for World War III. You know I mean? So you can get used to a life of luxury overnight, but it's very difficult to get used to a life of nothing, right? So I, I'm, I'm like, I can eat anything. Although I'm like used to the best food in the world, it doesn't matter to me. You know, if I just have to eat for function, I would just, okay, I have to eat this, otherwise I have every stomach, I will do that which I, I think um, not everybody can do that. Um, being positive is, I think, uh, in a way I can help because I'm well-known, you know, and, and then how do I use, for me, I'm well-known, I'm famous. How do I use this fame for other people? You know what I'm saying? How do I use it? So I, I, I like, I, I think I can, um, I think diet is one of the worst things that people cannot face. Uh, you know, I, I had a relative once in the ICU in a heart attack. And every person who get a heart attack get this diet, right? Which is the most... Okay, I've heard this thing. <laughs> you know, not worth living. So I, I think maybe one thing I would love to do and engage with, uh, you know, health professionals is how to... Uh, because I can cook yummy food, which is healthy. And I work with, uh, I, I did something with Topayo, you know, with the older people. And I said, I can create things, but always put me with a nutritionist or dietitian that tells me what are the things I have to do. And I can actually create two specs. You know, it's, it's quite easy. Then I think the other thing is that, uh, so I, I think the food part is the one that people cannot tahan. I don't, I don't Singaporeans are so one type, huh? <laughs> anything else but look at this food I want to die you know and they, they do that and they used to smuggle in this person is ICU could die get people to smuggle chocolates that brandy and I, I saw this happening you know and um, so I, I think one thing is to uh, I think die I mean you're talking about patience right and, yeah. and you know it's, it's, it's difficult to be positive on. I mean I'm, I'm very fortunate I think right but I, I see um how to be positive. So I, I think maybe one way is to really tackle how to makan nicely, you know, because truly it impacts people. I mean, it's so strange. Singaporeans are really so impacted by that. And um, uh, I think for me, sharing is, is quite uh, useful to people because, um, you know, if, if, if I'm 73, I just turned 73, and I'm used to the best food in the world and all this, and I can take it. It's better than, than them being told by a 25-year-old dietitian. 
you know, they won't believe it. I said, how do yes. you know? You haven't <laughs> lived through it, you know? So, so I think uh, for me, myself, I can, I can share this and, you know, I think it can help people. But um, I think one way to, when, when you have, when you're sick and something happens, um, just think that yesterday was yesterday. Very it's sound not, advice. It's not going to be the same. But yes, it's not only people who are sick. Look at COVID. Look at this whole two years. Yesterday is yesterday. People who have not been sick, they have to face that. Mm. So the life is never the same. Yeah. The world is never the same. And then I, I think it helps to that. Okay, that's yesterday. And then what's the new adventure today mm. or tomorrow? And, and I think that's a very difficult um, training for people. But you know, once you start thinking, I could have done. But even if you don't get sick, you could have done this, could have done that. I mean, you were doing geriatrics, right? I'm sure. After a certain age, you can't do a lot of things. I mean, what what I what I I really admire Stephen because honestly, would I do all that? My answer is no. So maybe we can't expect every kid. You know, like he's amazing for a father-in-law. You know, and and I think uh, we have to realize how amazing is his journey because. Would I do that? To be honest, as a human being, my answer may be no. And most people won't do it, you know? And, and so, but what he's done is like amazing. And he's, he's, but because I think he's had medical experience. So it may be, it may be, it may be interesting to him, right? You know, coming for these mm. solutions, it may be not interesting to other people. So, so we cannot expect the same caregiving from other people. And, and I think for caregivers, uh, really, they can't take it, they can't take it. You, you can't expect people to be able to, to uh, accept something which they can't. I mean, I feel, you know? And, but I think it's, it's the, the, the bad thing about Asian families is that they're doing nothing, but then they criticize you for doing something. You know, and this, this, this is a bad thing, which is, um, I don't face that in my family, but I come from a very modern family. But this thing about, you know, how can you say this about old people? It's a very, um, it's very discouraging. And family members shouldn't do that unless they want to take over the burden, you know. Mm. Don't yeah. criticize unless you want to do it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, okay, dump, you know, like, and, and I think that is cultural. So, you know, we have to do a lot of the cultural part. So I don't know how, you know, it's not, not easy. Like. I totally agree with you, Violet. Yeah. I think you, you, what you said, you can't expect all caregivers to be like him. And on a similar note, we can't expect all patients to be like you. You're such a wonderful patient, what, what you described the way you were, which is why you both won the Inspirational Patients and Caregiver Awards. Yeah. You know, that no, but is, I, I, that I think what I can do is I can share so that it will help other patients to maybe think differently, you know, because it's mindset, actually. Am I correct? Yeah, yep, absolutely. Everything is mindset, you know? Your whole journey is mindset. Yes. And we, we have a very interesting uh, question from a member of the audience, actually. You know, uh, and in, in, it's probably different in both your circumstance. So the, the, they ask, uh, you know, uh, was there any sort of uh, shared decision making when it came to decisions uh, in terms of your care or, you know, uh, for, for either of you? Uh, you know, probably in Stephen's case might be more challenging, maybe not with the patient, but with other family members. Maybe Stephen first. Yeah. Stephen, you want to share? Uh, I, I, I must say that if, if you know, there are um, shared decision making, uh, I will be gladly uh, receive it. But in most cases, you realize that uh, they will be looking at me to make that decision. Uh, but having said that, you know, I, I must be uh, grateful to my wife, uh, especially when we turn the whole home into a nursing home. <laughs> Both of us got to make a lot of decisions, you know, whether to buy this, buy that, and, uh, you know, um, um, making our house doesn't look nice with all the handles around, all the different mm. passageway of my father-in-law. That is something that, you know, a female will care, the guys will not care. Uh, but then when I make that decision, I need to make sure that, you know, my, my wife uh, heard me loud and clear and she agrees before I can have that uh, mounted uh, along the entire living room all the way to the bathroom and things like that. So that, that, that would be something that we would discuss. Um, but of course, um, like I mentioned, whatever decision we make, 
we will always want our mother-in-law to say yes first, including the, the decision to bring him to a daycare. It is going to be a challenging decision reason because people always think that putting people, putting the O's into a, a care, care center is always like giving them away, you know? Um, so we will always need to put it into another direction of, um, or rather another perspective of looking at things, things that you need your own life, he needs his own life, both of you need to have friends and, uh, you know, uh, friends of your own. So that is how we actually do the buy-in and before we make that decision, we actually ask our mother, um, I mean, my mother-in-law and when only when she say yes, then, then we will do that. So I, I hope I've answered that particular portion of the question about sharing of decision making. So we, we don't usually make the final decision without my mother-in-law say yes or no in that sense. Uh, but most of the time we are the one making the decision first by then, you know, uh, communicating in the right way to our in-law to for them to say yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, before I say, I think Stephen and his wife must have marriage of the year, you know. <laughs> I can tell you, I wife can of tell the year, wife most, of the year. Uh, most marriages cannot survive this, what they want to, honestly, to be honest, honestly. But in my case, um, you know, I'm an only child. My mother's an only child. Uh, and I have two children. And um, actually, that this whole, de this whole decision about the caregiving and all that, never came up because I wasn't, I wasn't bedridden, right? You know, I came home and I have, I have a housekeeper. And um, what was very lovely was that my, when I, my two grandsons were like maybe six and three years old then. And they had, when they came to visit me in GH, they said, oh, Opa was here. So their grandfather who passed away. So they remember that. And, uh, you know, so, it, and, and he had passed away. The, the day I went home, uh, the two grandsons insisted on staying with me and sleeping in my bed, which is a queen-size bed. And then they insisted that for every weekend for, you know, for years and years, which I think, um, you know, that, that loving thing from your grandchildren helps in the healing a lot, you know? And I, I think if people have families, um, apart from the practical care, the love is very important. You know, the, 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 the fact that my grandchildren insisted on sleeping with me, so that means I cannot get sick, right? Mm. You know, or whatever whatever I, I'm doing, it's like, oh my goodness, I, I have to uh, take care of myself because of them. And then I think when you have another motivation, it helps a lot. And, you know, and, and um, I think that caregiving thing wasn't a, um, sort of... Um, thing because I'm so independent mm. and it, it, you know it, I mean I'm so blessed you know if I was bedridden I could be different and I think that, that the motivation is, is very important because yeah. I'm, I'm sure you know um, yeah. Stephen was he was motivated by actually by his wife yeah you know yeah and then often uh, we, we find a source of inspiration in the, the people around us yeah. right but I yeah. think family I mean one thing to share is, I mean, I'm talking about Asian culture. Family shouldn't be um, so judgmental on things like respect and things like that, you know? It's, it's like, to me, it's very alien because I don't come from that sort of family. But to, 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 to me, putting a person in daycare is the best thing, is like going to school because he's socializing with other people of his age, you know? Rather than this family thinking that you're putting them in the home. Poor thing at home alone, you know? Yeah, correct. You know, I, I have a neighbor whose mother was 90 something, had cancer and survived. And every day she must go to this Jurong, don't know what, some uh, club or something with all the other old people. And she makes things and then she makes, she uh, knits things and it's sold, you know? And, but it's, it's her life, that, that social life of going to this, you know, she goes by bus to this place in, I don't know where she goes, but that whole day is her life. She's I think, meeting other people of her age. And I think uh, families, you know, there's a lot of cultural um, teaching, I think. That they prefer leaving an old person at home, totally lonely, without socializing. It's sad, right? Yeah. 
Oh man, I should bring, I should record this and play it to all my patients now in the, in the clinic. It's sad. Yeah, it's, because it you know, I, you know, I'm 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 seventy. I mean, maybe I'm sharing. I'm seventy three, like um, but I think I'm forever eighteen. I suppose that helps, right? No, I mean, I think I think I'm forever eighteen. Seriously, it's not a joke. But you know, fifteen years ago, I was um, uh, I was helping with Henderson Old Folk Home. And maybe I was younger then, you know, 50. And then we did turkey Christmas uh, lunch. And then um, Henderson Old Folks Home is wonderful because they, they are in the community. And then some, my friend was playing the piano. And the older people were all waiting uh, to come in for this lunch, you know, the, the different rooms. And the neighborhood older people, they invited. And then older people, 70 something, which I am now. And then she started playing and they started dancing. And in my mind, I said, we must remember that these people were young once. When they were young, they may have done the, you know, they, they may have like my time when the go-go dancing, everything. And a lot of people tend to classify their older relatives in the old. You know, and maybe one other sharing. I did something for Singapore Food Festival in 2009, Pranakan. So I asked um, the committee, I said, and I'm doing the PR, I said, is there any old person that can teach cooking, 100 years old. I don't care if she doesn't know how to cook, but we can teach her because it's very good optics, you know, like 100 year old. So somebody said, my grandmother, but she's very shy. She will never want to come, my grandmother. I said, ask her. So she came in a wheelchair to my flat. I said, she must teach me how to cook. And she showed me. And it was like, wow, you know, a generation before me, I'm learning some you know, technique and all that. Then the day before the press conference, this young man told me, by the way, my grandmother went to take out her jewelry. I mean, you know what it means, right? You know, older ladies, when they, when they take out their jewelry from the bank or the pawn shop, it is a mega event. It is like your, 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 your grandson getting married. And my grandmother went to perm her hair. I said, oh my God. So I phoned all the other people in the, in the, I said, you know, this old lady went to perm her hair, did her jewelry. We better do our hair, right? <laughs> Next day, she came fully dressed, a Pranakan lady so beautiful and then she stayed to the end of the press conference and you know i said none of you in your family have ever seen her as a person she's your grandmother this is the first time she's seen as a person in her own right and i think that's what we have to teach families maybe for geretic that you know this person is her own right that's my grandmother i love my grandmother i must respect my grandmother but she's not a person she's not a human being and this old woman came to life you know, she put her hair, she took out jewelry, she was dressed from top to toe, and she looked better than any of us. Because she was seen as a person. So maybe that's something we have to share with people taking care of older people. Yeah, now that sure. I'm getting older. <laughs> uh, as, as you said, I think you're forever young. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, you yeah. know, looking, and, and I think looking. families forget that if my grandmother, they are very old, they can't do things. But this person had a young life. You know? Yeah. Yep, yep, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. Looking looking at the comments, at the at the thing, there are a lot of thank yous, a lot of thank you for sharing, enlightening, heartwarming, a lot of agreements with what you all just said. Any There's question? one question about, about burnout. Um, I think that we dealt with that a little bit. Um, anything else, Mr. Stephen, you want to share about how you deal with burnout? This, this was at you, the question, besides the haven in your living room. Anything you do? Well, well I must say that I'm, I'm, after all, I'm a human. You know, uh, burnout is inevitable. Uh, to be honest, I just got a burnout like um, last weekend or something like that. Um, yeah, you know, when you, when you are so stressed at home and stressed at work, just a little comments from anybody could just Trigger, right? be the last, that straw, the last straw at the back of the camera and you are totally broken, you know. And of course, my wife got it from me again. And um, uh, I, I must admit that uh, many a times I get burnt out, but that day was the worst burnout I ever had. Um, so what I did was I told my wife that leave me alone. And I went out of my house. Um, for two days, I don't talk to anybody at home. <laughs> anybody who saw me, uh, uh, you know, they know that uh, I'm just, I just want to be myself. So I, I, I just went out and went back office, do my own thing, um, sit around. 
I happen to have some lounge area over at my office here where I can just sit around and relax and do my reading and do my own listening. Um, I'm actually a uh, I'm actually very much a, uh, a family man, so I don't really go out that often. I, I, I don't go pub and drink and get drunk and forget about all the things. Yeah, so yeah, <laughs> so for me, it's really, um, you know, being, being, being alone. Yeah, and just let me chill. Like I mentioned in my slides, you know, just allow the caregiver to air their frustration and don't judge them. Just let them do what they need. And they'll come back again strong. Um, many a times, we don't need anything. We just need to cool off and we'll be stronger because at the end of the day, we know what we need to do. It's just that, please give us space. I, I hope Thank I've answered the questions. Um, yeah, I, I tried. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Thank children? you for that. I agree. Oh, you have children. Question from. Uh, sorry, from... what was the question again? Uh, Stephen, do you have children? Uh, no, I don't. I don't. I actually have two dogs. That's all. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. I think they they are. I think easier to manage than children. I think. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> well, but anyway, <laughs> I'm really not too certain about that though. <laughs> anyway, I, I agree with that. Me time. That's why I, I would encourage everybody who has helpers like, just allow them to go for their off days like, along the same lines. Yeah. So like, you know, I think it's yeah. quite quite important. Like. Okay, before before I wrap things up, I just want to. I told you already before we start. I'm going to ask you what's your wish list for all the healthcare providers that that are present here today. You have seen the good and the bad when you were admitted, when your father-in-law was admitted. So going forward, you know, to improve the way we deliver healthcare. Um, what what is your wish list? Maybe I can get two or three things which you think that healthcare providers can improve um, towards the patients, towards the caregivers overall. Maybe I can start with Miss Un first. Um, well, I I've, I've never faced any bad bad reactions because maybe I speak well, right? I mean, honestly, it makes a difference, you know. Yeah. But um, maybe a sharing. I went to the CPF office and there's actually a unit for older people, believe it or not. It's a different, different uh, room altogether. And they've been trained to deal with older people, which is terrible, but I've seen them deal with older people. So I said, I said, how do you do it? They've been given training. And then they said that, um, I said, what's the longest CPF meeting they had with an older person was about four hours. Can you imagine? Wow. So, uh, and so I, I think maybe uh, people like me have no problem. People like educators have no problem because they know how to complain like nobody's business, right? But let's say <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But an older person who is maybe dialect, you know, and maybe um, and maybe there should be a bit different training. Like okay. how do you deal with them? And then uh, maybe, I'm not sure, but training with, uh, dealing with family, relatives, and I'm not sure whether we should even be given a protocol on, you know, we're given what to expect medically, but we're not given to expect what socially. You know, like this is what will happen, whatever, whatever. Uh, we do not have a microwave <laughs> or we do have a microwave or, you know what I'm saying? And, and those expectations, because, I mean, I tell you, you do not uh, heat bread in a microwave. You have to heat it in an oven, oven. But we do not have an oven, you know, that's it. And, and, yeah. um, and I think uh, those, um, because for me, the information is very easy. But, you know, maybe some, some um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm much older, so I'm, I don't understand this word called onboarding, you know, which is what people now, the HR people have to give an onboarding talk. Yes. The yeah. whole day on what to expect. And maybe there must be an onboarding. Okay. You know, I'm That's, not sure. Like, you know, I, I think... think yeah, I think that's 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 correct. Maybe I just rephrase it. I think the first thing you mentioned was upskill us to cater to the different needs of the older folks, yeah. whether they are you know sometimes they are slower, they don't understand English very well, all the technicality. So spend more time and also develop certain skills to cater the, to them better because people are getting older. And, and, you know? and maybe to train people in cultural nice nuances. Yeah. yeah. You know and um. Like you know, like people think you're abandoning the old person. You know, then you have to deal with how do you how do you uh, cycle the family that is not abandonment. To me, I think wonderfully they go to a daycare with forty other old people because that's their social life. 
yeah. but you know people prefer to stick their families at home yes, yes. And, i and think that will take time but i think it's very important yeah. i yeah. mean they put they, i mean multi millionaire they have three caregivers but they're multi millionaire to actually go and send to a uh, facility or support a facility you know what i'm saying yeah yeah but that 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 will be amazing if that happens <laughs> And the second thing you mentioned was whenever a patient comes in, that onboarding, right? the orientation of the patient to the hospital facility, the staff. I think the nurses That's do that, it. but very short one, you know? Yeah. It's a very brief one. People yeah. expect people to know what's happening, right? Mm. But I, I suppose patients are very demanding because it's very scary to be in a, to be in a hospital room. Yeah. yeah. It is yeah. very scary. Awesome. You know what I'm saying? Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Stephen, what are your wish lists? What is your wish list? It's in your mute. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Um, three wish lists. Uh, first, communicate right. <laughs> I mean, um, I, I understand that you know, um, uh, doctors see patients more than patient ourselves or caregivers see a patient, especially in life. But you know, sometimes uh, do take into consideration the feeling of the caregiver when giving bad news. Uh, communicate right. That's one thing. Uh, second thing, um, emergency department. <laughs> It's always very stressful, uh, you know, bringing my in-law to the emergency department because once he gets in, I don't know what is going on. Uh, yeah. Is there a way whereby we could actually know somehow, you know, like, um, like in polyclinic, we can actually know where we are supposed to go through and the process. So is there any way whereby we can actually know where my father-in-law is right now, whether is he going through some tests or something like that? At least we know what is going on inside. You know, at the time where you send a, a patient into the A and E, we're already in distress mode, <laughs> not knowing things that is happening. It adds more stress to us. So if we could have like you know, uh, okay, he's being served at this, you know, being doing some tests, and you will take uh, a while or something like that. You know, we don't need people to come and tell us, but at least you know, if there's some apps or something like that that we can follow through, that would be helpful. But that brings me to the third, third, third things. I'm trying to promote this digitalization, but yet my third list is that do not digitalize everything. Because digital, digitalization is good, but not for everything and everybody. Uh, do strike a balance between certain services that requires that personal touch, uh, the personal guidance, rather than digitalizing everything. Because at the end of the day, there are some people who are just not able to you know, follow that advancement in the technology mm. that they will not know how to go through and navigate through the entire healthcare system at all. Yeah, these are my three wishes and I hope, um, yeah, I, I hope you know, something can be done today. Thank you very much. Maybe uh, these safe distance ambassadors, we don't have work anymore, huh? can be. <laughs> I, you know, maybe there's medical and maybe there's the ambassadors you know, in, in the hospitals, which is a different job altogether. Because the person taking care of your medical has no time to go and explain so much. Honestly, they will take care of the next patient. You know? So, so we, had, we had SQ, SQ staff with us yeah. as, as care ambassadors for the last two years. Yeah. Now they are also gone, you know, so they're also so, back flying. So I think there is going to be a I gap think, there. I think it's a different job, right? Because you can't have that medical person doing that and then, then, then they're not taking care of another person's patient. Yeah, yeah, correct, correct. Yeah. So, so back to that wish, because I think number two, uh, if any a &E staff are watching, I think it might be an idea for a QI, QI project, uh, providing real-time updates to, to, to family and, and caregivers of a &E patients, because I totally agree, because a &E is a place of, because people are in extremists, they are in crisis. No so what's land, happening right? to them? Yeah, it's no man's land. And, and once they're inside, it's like they are inside and there's no way to see what's happening or know what's happening. So it might be a QI project, like, using technology, providing them real-time updates. It might be something worth doing and actually mm -hmm. uh, affect the patient's experience. I think it might be worthwhile. Like. I worked in the A&E for 15 months uh, during my training. So I, I can relate to what you just said. Like. It's true. I think it's a different job yeah. from, the, from the medical staff. So it's another person altogether, you know. Yeah, it can be another person, it can be an app, it can be someone controlling the app, you know. So I think yeah. I think it's a it's a project which is waiting to happen. I think it's a very worthwhile project to embark on. Yeah. Yes. I, I don't mind volunteering myself that. as one of the uh, you know more yeah. jobs. I think uh, because I, I'm also on spend and I'm actually volunteering myself in the EM project as well. Uh, but I, I just don't mind being part of that because I think it mm. is important. 
for the uh, yes. people, especially our our generations, or rather our our you know we are we are having more uh, senior citizens now in our population. I think this is essential. Um, yeah, I I really don't mind uh, you know being part of the entire team to provide that perspective from a caregiver perspective or patient perspective. Yeah, I think there are a few people who agree with with uh, with what you just said about the the A and E. Yeah, um, yeah, it's about making the information available through an interface. I think that's that's. Yes, right. uh, I think it's there for the medical technologists to to come up with an app. Like, amazing. Okay, thank you, thank you so much for both of you. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, Stephen, we will get in touch on how to engage your father-in-law. Um, yes, yes. At home, I can give you some tips also, and I Thank think the any people might follow up on that. And and Violet, I'm so happy to see you. I went to your restaurant; the food was so tasty. I'm probably gonna come back there again. Okay, um, that's lovely. Thank bring, you so much. Bring bring my bring my foreign guests and all that because yeah. you must WhatsApp to me. Oh, before people I go, definitely, I think both of us will. <laughs> no, we, have, we have a plant based menu. You know, we have a menu for every uh, sort of um, diet. Yeah, I think I saw that menu, but then I'm pure non-veg, lah. You know, I don't eat know. vegan and all that stuff. Know, but the kueh pie tea with the prawn was outstanding. And I'm probably going to so go much. back for that. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. So yeah, yeah, thank you both of us for sharing. Thank you, Dr. Warren, for co-moderating and guiding no, me also no through course. this. The first time I'm doing this. Um, thank and I think thank, thanks attending. to everyone for the wonderful session. You know, I I learned right, so much, and session. and I think as we always say, as uh, doctors, you know, uh, in healthcare. Uh, professionals, uh, patients are really our inspiration and, and as are their caregivers. And, and, you know, every time in clinic, uh, I, I never fail to gain inspiration from all of you. Uh, and I hope that every one of my colleagues does so too, because it's what's keeping us going uh, in Maybe good times and bad thing, times. One last thing to share with you. My grandfather graduated in 1916 from KE Medical School. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've written a story. 100 years, 200 plus over years ago. Really. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've written a story in Alumnus magazine. Maybe I can share with you about three generations of my family being in um, NUS. And when I was in the hospital, I was looking at the building which my grandfather studied in. And it was Inspirational. Lovely. Okay, and so not to hold you all back, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Rosan. And, uh, you know, if anyone else has any questions, please, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. And, and uh, don't forget to give us your feedback and, and any future suggestions uh, for future webinars that you'd like to hear about. Okay, thank you all. And I wish you all a great afternoon ahead. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.